and and the thing is, Artie, when you get me that ounce there from the mail, uh, send it in the mail, and I'll pass it on to Brian. Brian, you can mix it up and distribute it. Uh, better said. Okay, so let's go live now. All right. So here we are. Here we are. And I'm glad Artie's here. Ardwolf, ladies and gentlemen, is Hello. here. And we have Brian Train. Brian Train is 6,000 kilometers, not kilometers, kilometers away from me. And look, look at technology today. We can speak with Brian Train in his house wearing a jacket and a hat. Brian, can you explain uh, what's wrong with your heating? Oh, <laughs> well, um, about five months ago, um, we, uh, my wife decided uh, it was time to do some renos in the house. Uh, so I am in the sort of basement family room of the house where much of the house has relocated itself. So there is a heater in this room, but it's barricaded by about half a ton of uh, shoes, furniture, books, uh, you know, shipping containers, all this kind of stuff. So uh, anyway, it's it's a little chilly down here. Yeah, hence, you know the, what? hence the triple layers. And you have, uh, and it's funny you said triple layer because you're a guy from BC. As a, a more, you're Victoria, right? You're in Victoria. That's right. <clears throat> that's that's where all the rich people live. Is that right, Brian? Uh, well, it's um, it, it costs a little bit more to live here than other places. Uh, but even we have a rich area in town. It's called Uplands, and uh, that's where you get some uh, multi-million dollar houses. Wow. But uh, no, I live in a sort of suburban area of uh, of, of Victoria. Uh, it's, I'm about a mile away from the campus of the University of Victoria, which is uh, also where I went to school. Um, and I came out here in 1976. My dad was a Mountie and we got transferred out here. And I've lived here off and on ever since. Um, I've you know, spent some time living overseas or working in Ottawa and places, but I spent most of my life here. Now, Brian, uh, it's for, not, for, the it's, for the American people, because I've been asked this, mm -hmm. uh, your dad being a Mountie, he was not riding a moose. He was riding a horse, is that right? Well, yeah, they did teach him how to ride a horse. And I, well, there's another funny anecdote if you want. Go ahead. Um, the, my dad joined the uh, my dad joined the RCMP in the early '60s and about 1962, and he had just finished uh, training at Depot Division in um, in, in Saskatchewan. And uh, just as he finished training, uh, they this film company decided to make a film. And it was called The Canadians. And it was the last of the singing Mountie genre of, of Westerns. And it had Robert Ryan in it as, uh, you know, people will remember Robert Ryan as the, one of the generals from Battle of the Bulge and a bunch of other war movies. Anyway, in this one, he played uh, Sam Steele, who was a commissioner of, of the RCMP. And he was sent to, you know, pacify a, an Indian tribe or something like that. That's, that's a very was, nice word. But it was filmed out on the Cypress Hills of Saskatchewan. Um, and for extras, they used a bunch of guys from Depot Division in the RCMP because they all knew how to ride horses. And uh, they just decked them out in the old red serge uniforms, you know, period costume and that kind of thing. And um, in, in the early part of the movie, there is a scene where they're having morning parade and they have a small cannon and they fire the cannon, you know, it's sort of like the morning gun. And you can see the back of my dad's head just as they fire the cannon and a cloud of smoke comes out and obscures him. And that is the beginning and end of my father's film <laughs> film career. That's that's a total on screen time. <laughs> yeah. But that I, movie was so bad, it killed off the the, the sort of the Mountie Western genre. You know, there's yeah. about like I don't know six or eight movies like that. Yeah, you know, it, like it, I, Sergeant Preston of the Mounted. Yeah, and, yeah. I, I don't know. know Mounties, Mounties. I think <clears> because of their uniforms, don't make a very good Western. You know, it's like you don't got that Clint Eastwood look. You know, you're all red and bright, and you got this hat, and it's like, what the hell is that? I'd like yeah. to welcome everyone to the most Canadian conversation ever. Yes, and I was going to continue <laughs> on the Canadianness, Brian. You you are Canadian, is that right? 
Oh, yes. Yes. I was, uh, as I said, my dad was a Maori. I was born in Newfoundland, so on the uh, the left, uh, the right-hand edge of Canada, and I spent most of my life uh, living out here on the left-hand edge of Canada, and I've seen most of Canada in between. Never been to the far north, but I passed through, you know, pretty much most of the country. You've been to Quebec? Oh, yes. I spent, uh, um, I've, I've, I've visited Quebec uh, a lot, and I spent one uh, the, the summer that I graduated from uh, from the university, I spent um, a summer term doing uh, French immersion at Université Laval. It was a program called La Maison Française. Oui. And yeah, but that was a very long time ago. So yeah, le, le français uh, est presque oublié. Now, uh, you being a... a, a, a a game designer. I'm sure you're immersed into history. Sorry, um, Artie, I'm, 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 I'm going to get to you. Just... <laughs> it's all good. And you being a, a game I'm designer. I'm from Ohio. <laughs> and you're, you're immersed, obviously, in history. Uh, would, it, would it be right to say that Quebec, Quebec City, is the North American cradle of civilization? Uh, other than the Aboriginals, obviously. 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 The well, First Nations, obviously. Let's 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 exclude them. I, I, God, I'm going to get in trouble here. Well, you know what I'm trying to say. I know what you're trying to say. So, um, am I right? I would say, it, yeah, it's it's probably the cradle of Western civilization as it came to um, you know to North America, and you know, predictably, it's a fortress. <laughs> <laughs> so they move in, and the first place they build is a, a trading post, and then they build a fortress. Or maybe the fortress came first in any way. Um, but, yeah, actually, Brant, I think uh, that um, – I, I think Quebec is older than New Orleans. Yeah, Brant, wake up, get out. And actually, What's the, the matter with this guy? He's from Ohio, too. And people will tell you that uh, the first Western intrusion into North America was actually the Vikings, who set up some uh, settlements, you know, in, in what is today uh, Labrador, Newfoundland. Or Newfoundland. Right, Newfoundland. And, and of course, you know, the, the Indians, uh, you know, killed them all, and they just couldn't make a go of it. Yeah. Um, but that was like, oh, I, th I think it was like 900 AD or something. I could be wrong there. Yeah, I, but, it's funny. I just read that. I just read uh -huh. that. I know. cries out for a war game treatment. The primary sources are actually some of the easiest Viking sagas to read. You're talking mm -hmm. about like, you're talking about Brian like developing a game like that. I'm saying for you know I I just think it's a good idea. I've never I seen a game on the idea. topic. Why not? I think it's a great idea. I don't I don't think we have enough games or battles that deal with the Canadians like whooping ass. You know what I'm saying? Because Brian whooped ass in 1812. We we took care. We took care and we shellacked these guys. I'm not shellacked. sure we're on the same page regarding the theme of this perspective project. Mm. But and I and I generally don't work before 1918, so that's me out. Oh, because I, I, I was because in uh, we were talking about Les Coteaux, where I live, where was there was a British garrison of about I think three to four hundred uh, British soldiers, and so the Americans always tried to come in through the. Uh, the rapids of of uh, Saint Francois, whatever, and they can never make it, whatever, whatever. So, okay, okay, <clears throat> let's get on the interview. Huh? <laughs> oh. So, I have a question, Brian Train. Brian yes. Train, you have a website called um, Ludic Futurism. Is that That's right? right? That's oh. right. And um, you just recently posted um, a article on Minutemen Mark II. An old SPI game by Dunnigan, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. Minuteman, the Second American Revolution, uh, published in 1976. Now you say that's one of your favorite games. That's what you write. Now, why? What's going on? Well, uh, it, it's. Um, I found it. Well, I, I guess this goes back to the beginning of of my involvement with with war games. Um, but I started in about 1978. And um, my first war game was Tactics 2, you know, and my favorite uncle gave me a copy of that for Christmas. And I think it was a long time before my parents forgave him for that. <laughs> but uh, from an early start, from an early time, I found that people were not really publishing the kinds of games uh, that I wanted to play. And they weren't touching on the kinds of subjects that I wanted to see explored. And 
I've always been into politics and the military and just the area where those two cross. And in the late 70s, early 80s, there were not very many Paul Mill type games. And so when this game came along, uh, the theme is uh, it takes place in about 2020, uh, but it's about a future American revolution uh, in the United States. And James Dunnigan published it in 1976 as part of his line of power politics series games. So other games in the series were uh, his uh, plot to assassinate Hitler, uh, Russian Civil War, uh, Redmond Simonson did uh, After the Holocaust, and uh, these were all really interesting in their way. Um, and they were pol games that were half politics, half military. And I really liked it. And I like the idea of Minuteman. Uh, I, you know, again, this is me playing it in about 1982, 1984. So uh, I... You know, I, I didn't think it was all that plausible, but if you read Dunnigan's uh, little backstory to the basic scenario in the game, which I put in that blog entry, um, you'll it, it seems you know a little a little prescient, you know, for from the from the distance of nineteen forty five uh, of forty five years away, I think that's pretty good. Um, but the the idea of of taking an insurgency movement and and building it you know in cities uh and and just spreading out from there and the idea of putting together and building an insurgency and of course organizing to fight the insurgency james dunnigan had uh some really interesting mechanics uh with that uh actually in all of his um power politics series games he had a lot of really interesting mechanisms uh that weren't really widely repeated in other games um and so I, that's what I found really interesting about it. And it's always been one of my favorites. And, uh, you know, I, I just thought it was time to, you know, maybe just uh, give it a little bit of a, of a prominence. Sorry, was that your first experience to that kind of theme in a war game? Yeah, I think it was actually, because um, as I said, I started playing in 78 and I was 15 years old at the time. So I had very, very little money, uh, you know, to buy games with. And uh, there was one store in town that had a used war games <clears throat> pile and I used to uh, scoop stuff out of there. So my first few games, war games were things like, uh, you know, SPI folio series games, the old Meta Gaming science fiction micro games, you know, little ones came in a little plastic envelope. Um, but that was one of the first larger games there. That's excellent, excellent. I started on that one. Um, and uh, yeah, that was one of the, the first sort of full size games that I, I, I played. And I had enough time to play it. And I just, I remember I was in, I was in university at the time. And I just remember, wait, you know, not wasting, spending many hours playing it when I probably should have been studying, you know, listening, <laughs> listening to the clash on headphones and talking heads, you know, like I quoted life during wartime, the lyrics uh, to that song uh, in, in the blog post. And uh, it just struck me that those um, lyrics are actually ideologically neutral. You know, there's a... <laughs> You know, there's like a certain there's a reference to a, a you know a, a quote from Mao in it, but the rest of it is is just kind of um, you know it's kind of um, politically agnostic. It's about hiding out, you know, in the middle of violence and uh, you know trying to trying to put something together out of the mess. Um, I don't know I don't know how to put a, a comment in, but if you could put in uh, the um, the URL for for my for my blog. Okay, hold on a second. Let me get it. Uh, let me get it. Um, boom, blast, smash, and that, and this, and that, and that. I got it. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. I just, I didn't know how to leave a comment uh, in the window here, so. I don't, yeah, either, I don't know. So I, I don't I know how to put it on YouTube. To relinquish yeah. uh, control here, but yeah, if this is, the, this is the first time I've used this uh, this Streamyard uh, software that Dan has. Um, I mean, like everybody else, I'm used to Zoom by now. Zoom, and, and I'm just discovering Discord. So, yeah, uh, yeah, just trying to figure out um, how to use. I know. That. I know. I know. And it's it's actually Discord is supposed to be logical, but there's so much. For me, I'm ADD. Yeah. There's so much yeah. logical in it, and it's like, yeah. what the hey? But anyways, going back to the SPI game, 
Mm -hmm. You quoted the uh, uh, fear of music by talking heads. Mm -hmm. So what's going on with that? Well, it's a great album. Um, it, it's, it's a great album. And life during wartime is one of the songs on, on that album. Right. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it, it's just one that I always, I used to play that album, you know, when I was playing the, the, uh, you know, playing Minuteman and, uh, what's what, what I play by the clash Sandinista was good, you know, Washington bullets, you know, okay. that was, that's a good song. And so you're, you're, uh, another good one called the call up. That was a good one. You're my age, Brian, you were born in 64, right? That's right. Yeah. I'm the same, same age as you. And it's funny that, um, you got into the clash and, uh, talking heads where most of the stuff was happening was progressive rock. Just yeah. like, you know what I mean? But anyway, yeah. all right. Oh, uh, I, got into, I got into the weird stuff right away. Yeah. Well, you're talking to the right guy for weird. And I think, I think Artie up there is, is kind of weird too, man. Oh, a little bit. You're a little bit weird. What's, what's your musical thing, uh, Artie? I'm still a prog rock guy. You look at that, huh? Oh, loves die hard. Man. I'm on, I'm on duel two. Is, do you a, know, is a personal favorite. Do you know who's a who's a big prog rock guy? Is John Compton, hmm. and of course he he's a musician. He studied music composition and all this kind of stuff. So, but I know he's a big fan of prog rock. We've well, I, about I, 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 excuse my ignorance, but who is John Compton? John Compton, uh, One Small Step Games. Hmm. Oh, way no way no way no way. I gotta take this down. Yeah, John J O N Compton. And uh, yeah, he's one small step. Um, and he designed Battle for Baghdad, which is an interesting adaptation of the Dune system uh, for a, a political military game. He, he's worked with Joe Miranda a bit, as have I. Um, and uh, yeah, he lives he lives in Virginia now. I think Alexandria. I'm not sure. Well, I'm going to give him a buzz because that's for me. That's interesting right away. You yeah. Know, uh, but the uh, uh, Artie man. Ask the man uh, a question that I, I can't even fathom. Okay, so, well, I I did come Hopefully prepared with a it. question. Um, brief Border Wars. Yeah. So what, what sparked your interest in, in any, really, of these titles? None of which, I mean, I was vaguely aware that there was, in fact, the Third Indochina War. Um, but I knew nothing about it. So what, what was the, the, the impetus for you to, to become interested in these topics enough to design a game on them? Well, that's a very interesting and unconscious segue <laughs> because I was just talking about John Compton and a couple of years ago, John Compton and some other people and I were farting around on Consum World Expo uh, discussing short wars and he mentioned that uh, there was a, uh, a, a war that was one week long fought between Poland and Czechoslovakia. Uh, at the beginning of 1919 in the Teshin region. Uh, and it, uh, it, it was a, just a, a border conflict, you know, a few battalions on either side, uh, and it was over quickly. Um, and someone was saying, well, how come there's never been a, a war on... Uh, sorry, I'm just waving goodbye to my dad. He's just visiting. Um, anyway, uh, so someone was saying why isn't there a game on this on this particular brief border war and i and i thought well you know i mean why not do something like that i always i always like to tackle subjects that nobody else has touched before so you know even today i've, I've got uh, things that you know nobody on subjects that nobody else has touched so i looked into it and it didn't look really interesting enough and i couldn't find enough details about it to make a convincing game but i kept thinking about the idea and then a little while later um, I, I found out about another war that lasted only one week, and this one was called the Little War, and it was fought between Hungary and Slovakia for one week in March of 1939. So this was just at the time when Czechoslovakia was falling apart into Bohemia and Slovakia and Ruthenia, and the Czech army was dissolving itself into a mass of Czech and Slovak and Ruthenian individuals. And at the time that this was happening, and Germany was gobbling up Bohemia. This is like March 1939, just a few months before the beginning of the war. And Hungary thought, oh, well, we'll nip off a bit of Slovakia. Um, so they fought a war with, you know, just these scratch Czech forces for about a week before the Germans said, OK, stop. You know, you know this this stops now. Um, and anyway, I made a, a, a game out of that uh, that used just like, I don't know, 35 counters or something like that. And I got the idea for the card 
a, you know, the card driven uh, aspect of it as, as well. I thought, you know, I'll, I'll use a, a deck of, of uh, ordinary playing cards to kind of like drive the action in this. Um, and it fit the criterion that I was developing uh, for, for these kinds of wars. Uh, they had to be very short you know, like weeks or months at most. Uh, they had to uh, have a definite beginning and end. They had to have some uh, kind of political or geographical restrictions uh, on on the way the war was fought so they didn't get out of hand. Um, and the end state historically is generally pretty much the way it was at the beginning of, uh, of the conflict. Um, so with those criteria in mind, that's when I, I and, and with the Little War, which I bundled into uh, a game uh, that I published through Hollandspiel called Ukrainian Crisis. So people seem to find the Little War interesting as, you know, the second part of this two game package. I started thinking about what are other situations I could pick out uh, for this quad, because then I thought, you know, look, if, if it's I'm going to do like only 40 or 50 counters each, then I'll, I'll just fill up one counter sheet and make a quad. And so uh, the four that I picked uh, were, help me out here. Uh, um, the Football War, Operation oh, yeah. Attila, the yeah. Third Indochina War, which yeah. is the only one of these four that I had previously actually heard of, and yeah. the Second Lebanon War, which I that think is. I was also probably vaguely aware had occurred. Yeah, that's right. So uh, again, all of these, uh, all of these, um, the, these situations fit my criteria. The only partial exception would be Attila, which is the Turkish invasion of Cyprus in 1974, and it ended with uh, about half of the island uh, under Turkish control, and that, um, and and so that worked out. And as a matter of fact, I've spent a lot of time uh, this this year, and well, most of last year, working on Volume Two of Brief Border Wars because Bill Gibbs uh, thought, you know, uh, he realized that, you know, sales for this quad were pretty brisk. And they thought that, uh, you know, we'll do a volume two and they wanted to see a bunch of pre-1945 titles. Um, so the four in the volume two of the quad, the four battles I picked are Teshin, 1919. Okay, so I went back and did some more research and, uh, and uh, made a game of it. Uh, Second Balkan War, uh, 1912. Uh, Nomanhan, 1939, also known as Halkin Gaul. So that's the Soviets and the Japanese fighting in Mongolia in 1939. And the Italo-Greek War, uh, 1940. So that was just the first part of uh, the Italian uh, and, and Greek War up in the mountains. So uh, that seemed to be a pretty good uh, a, a choice of... of um, of uh, titles for the quad. Uh, I've got them pretty much where I want them. Um, I just need to do some more play testing, you know, and, and pacing, and I'll be ready to send that in and put that in the pipeline, however long Compass Games, you know, wants to keep it in the pipeline or whatever kind of uh, scheme they want to make it uh, come out. And if people are not sick of it completely, including me, if I'm not completely sick of it by then, uh, I might do volume three, and they would be all modern titles. So I'm thinking of things like, uh, you know, maybe a, an Angolan, uh, like a South Africa Angolan border war, you know, one of the short external border campaigns they did, uh, maybe an Indo-Pakistani uh, engagement, you know, been a few to pick from, um, Transnistria, you know, there's all kinds of, of things. I, I, there's an awful lot of uh, topics that present themselves, you know, there's an awful lot of border wars in the 20th and 21st century, but not very many of them fit the criteria that I that I set for myself in this. So, I, and I think I'm going to stick with them. Is there? Anyway, you'll a, see volume two at some point, maybe volume three. That was actually going to be a question I was going to ask anyway. Um, are there any? As a designer, do you find that there are design challenges that are specific to uh, modeling conflicts that are this short because of their brevity, as opposed to a more conventionally lengthy? war game topic yeah um there it's a blessing and a curse uh you know because it, it for one part logistics uh doesn't really enter into it too much like like the football war for example that that's also known as the hundred hour war because literally within in less than four days uh the organization of american states shut 
you know, pressured both sides to shut the conflict down. So people more or less, you know, went to war with what they happened to have, you know, at the time. There was very, very little time for preparation. Um, and, you know, the pace of combat, you know, wasn't that intense either. Uh, so logistics is not quite that important. So that kind of forgives you from from getting into any kind of um, really intense logistic rules. Uh you know, which I think should always be appropriately reflected in a war game. Um, but because this was a simple, meant to be a very simple and fast game, it was a good idea to try and not to lumber it down with too much about logistics. Um, I also made the decision, you know, like the first game, The Little War I mentioned, uh, its length was uh, governed by the size of a deck of playing cards. Um, so you have uh, each side has uh, uh, like about... Uh, uh, 25 cards, uh, 26 cards to play with. Um, some of them are special purpose cards where you refit, you know, units or stuff like that. And then some of them are used for movement. Some of them are used for combat. Now I altered that a little bit uh, for the brief border wars game because it has a special deck of cards instead of a, a deck of ordinary playing cards. Um, but still, the idea is is that the maximum length of any game is seven turns. Seven turns doesn't give you very much time. To accomplish what it is that you want to get done so you know uh, pressure's on very little time and it makes people uh i think concentrate uh, so that's a, that's a bit of a design challenge uh because people have to think very carefully about what it is that they're trying to accomplish um so what else would there be uh for that particular type of more and oh i see that somebody uh asked a question about uh you know asking why did i make it a cr criterion that the war w should be inconclusive well uh historically inconclusive generally uh no the political calculus at the end of the war was obviously different because the hundred hour war you know between el salvador and honduras uh everybody ended up almost exactly where they started um but there was huge damage to the economies of both countries and it poisoned foreign relations between the two countries for a long, long time afterwards. Um, not that they hadn't been poisoned before because, you know, this war was not about a soccer game. You know, that was just the crisis that happened to trigger that. But there had been tensions building between the two countries. Um, but militarily, yes, it was inconclusive. And so the challenge there in design in working out a game like that is to work out some interesting victory conditions most of the victory conditions in these games uh rely on seizing terrain and having a a, a grip on on areas of terrain um and some some areas of terrain are worth more than others so for example in teshin the teshin game that i'm working on um, the reason why those countries, uh, Poland and Czechoslovakia, were fighting over the area in the first place was because there are huge coal fields in that area. So a lot of coal mines, uh, one of the biggest steel plants uh, in, um, in, in Eastern Europe, it was located there. Uh, so those are our partial uh, geographical objectives. But also it was for seizing, uh, seizing terrain, either to get some kind of a geopolitical advantage uh, or in some cases a demographic uh, to stake out a demographic claim. So you look at uh, the Turkish invasion of Cyprus. The reason why they did that was to protect, you know, ostensibly to protect the Turkish minority on the island. So, you know, and that relates to, to seizing land. So that's where the victory conditions are for most of those. So I, I would say those are, those are three of the main things that I grappled with uh, in designing these really short games. Um, you know, logistics, uh, you know, uh, controlling the pace of the action, keeping it intense, and uh, working out victory conditions. Now, these are three things that are really important to any war game that you're working on, but, you know, just the, the very short, sharp nature of the conflicts, um, really, you really, I really had to, to focus on it for those. Uh, can you answer that question, uh, Brian? I'm sorry? Can you see that? Uh, can you see that on the screen? Uh Yes. Uh, and I, uh, so this is Homo Ludens, his question yeah, about right, political right, and economic right. aspects. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, we get these comments streaming by. Hello, Tom. Nice to see you. Um, uh, and uh, well, yes. And that's part of the victory conditions. Like I was talking about the victory conditions a moment ago. So sometimes <clears throat> the, um, you know, as I said, uh, like in the case of Cyprus, 1974, they're staking out uh, more of a demographic claim, you know, to protect the, uh, you know, to protect the, um, the, the, the Turkish minority 
uh, on the island, and it was also to you know to gain some kind of uh, you know I guess some kind of, of um, bases and good positioning in the Mediterranean. Um, so yeah, I mean every war has political and economic causes, and so you kind of have to take those as written you know at the beginning of the game. Uh, but I would say that they would probably color the uh they would color the victory conditions that you're trying to set up and again you know these are meant to be really simple fast games so i you know i, I didn't get into it too much uh, but i also mentioned before one of my criteria was political um, restrictions on the conduct of the war and that's an aspect that you see for example in volume one of the third indochina war game because in in the Third Indochina War of 1979, both Vietnam and China had very large air forces, but nobody used aircraft. I don't even think they used spotter aircraft, uh, you know, during the war on any large scale at all. And this was something that both sides very uh, consciously restricted themselves from doing. So there were no there was no terror bombing of Hanoi or Haiphong or anything like that. Uh, it was like both parties had kind of it seemed that they had kind of agreed to leave this to be just a struggle over the particular border regions and China's objectives. You know, in this case, um, you know what they said publicly was the, the the war was to teach Vietnam a lesson. You know, uh, and to punish it for invading Cambodia, its client state. Um, but but also to kind of you know flex their muscles a little bit because you know china and vietnam have never really gotten along all that closely but that was one particular restriction you know a political well, it was one that was imposed on them by the political and military leadership i would think would was refraining from using their air forces Not so that's an, that's an example so I, I hope that kind of answers uh, part of your question mr ludens yeah and you do you know fred fred is a uh, um uh, Mr. Ludens, Fred Serval, he's he's designing that game. Oh, okay, it's Fred. I, I'm sorry, I don't know people's screen names. No, it's okay. I mean, I know it because I do this, so uh, I wouldn't know it anyways, you know. Uh, but it, yeah, uh, Artie, do you have a question or do I ask a? a, a... Oh, you go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Sure, turn. Okay, Brian. <clears throat> um, I was speaking. To, I speak to Harold Buchanan once in a while. You know, we talk and we have a good time, and yep. names pop up and. Great guy. And, and, and your name popped up for some reason. And you can tell me, Dan, I don't want to talk about it. Burning Man. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. You want to know about, you want to know about the pants, Zuka? That's thank you very yes, much. Yeah. Yes. What's, what's going well, on? First of all, explain really shortly uh, uh, what Burning Man is. And you created a bazooka that throws pants <laughs> yes Did you call a pant zuka? i do remember yeah. this story but please <laughs> would you please would you yeah please, uh, go ahead well, uh, well I'll, I'll i'll tell you what I, I can tell you what burning man was uh because i i haven't been for 12 or 13 years uh the last time i went was 2007 but before that i went for five years in a row um uh, it, Burning Man, it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like a very weird arts and culture festival uh, out in uh, this piece of desert uh, about um, I, I guess about an hour or two north of Reno. So it's in northern Nevada on this big flat piece of desert, which is actually an, an ancient lake bed. And so uh, at the time that I went there, uh, like I went for five years running and when the first year I went, there was something like mm, maybe about 20,000 people there. And the last year that I went, it was something on the order of 35, maybe 40,000. Yeah, yeah. How long does it last? It lasts about a week. Uh, it's the run up to Labor Day weekend. Uh, and, uh, while you know what 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 happens is uh you know there are people there who work there you know during part of the year to kind of like lay out streets and kind of organize you know the kind of services that everyone's going to be using you know like sanitation and uh you know keeping the streets straight and and starting to build the burning man which is this big wooden sculpture uh that they have in the center of this uh of the city 
you know, which is laid out like a big watch dial kind of. No, it sounds very uh, much like a like a Hammer horror movie, like The Wicker Man or something. But anyway, yeah, it looks a lot like The Wicker Man. Well, it it, it changes every year. You know, there's different designs. Um, and as I said, I last went 13 years ago, so it's a, a very different game from what I was, you know, back then. Anyway, the first onto the Panzuka. <laughs> I, I don't know why. I don't know. I, I guess I guess this came about because I, I go to Consum World Expo in Tempe uh, every year. That Where I, I hope to God everyone is wearing pants. Well, <laughs> I met Harold Buchanan there. And Harold and I, uh, we went out to dinner one night. And for some reason, I started talking about Burning Man. I happened to mention the Pantsuka. And so... Harold is, is just he's really obsessed with this with the with the, um, with the Pansuka. So anyway, the first year that I went was in 2003 and I went with Joe Miranda actually. So <laughs> I've been five times. Joe was, Joe's been once. You know, uh, I'm sure there's some stories, but anyways. Yep. So Joe and I went and we shared a campsite uh, and uh, we were there in, 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 we were there at Burning Man and we happened to be um, camped next to uh, a, 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 a big Winnebago full of swingers from Washington. I think they were from Washington state. It's, it's a long time ago. And anyway, uh, we borrowed an air compressor from, from them to make the first Pantsuka, you know, uh, Pantsuka Mark One, the air compressed. Yeah, model. Mark One, yeah. Yeah, because <clears throat> one thing about uh, Burning Man is, you know, essentially it's clothing optional. A lot of the people are there, they're like old hippies or artist types. Is, is it lawless? It's lawless? No, it is not lawless. As a matter of fact, it's pretty heavily policed. Uh, there's a lot of law enforcement there, uh, but people there to just, you know, to go there and just kind of like be another person and be kind of freaky for a while. But, you know, people are generally pretty law abiding. Um because you have a lot of people, you know, who are crammed into a, a very short, uh, very small area for a short period of time. And um, it's kind of intense. And so people are, are pretty well behaved. Anyway, um, as I said, the whole area is kind of clothing optional. And one aspect of, of that clothing optional is Donald Ducks. And this is what we call guys who walk around with a shirt on, but no pants. Because, you know, Donald, Donald wears a shirt, but he's got no pants. And Porky, Porky Pig, he wears pants sometimes, but he's got no shirt. He's got a little, a little vest or something like that. Or maybe sometimes a vest is all he has. Anyway, Donald Ducks. So we thought what we should do as a public service is we should invent something that will launch a pair of tidy whities at somebody, you know, and kind of remind them, hey, you know, pal, I know it's clothing optional, but you might want to cover up. You know, don't, <laughs> Don't get, don't get don't get sunburn on your most on the tip of your most personal private appendage. Clothing optional, sunburn mandatory. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, so anyway, Joe and I uh, we we begged this air compressor off uh, the swingers <laughs> next door, and uh, rigged it up. With don't ask what they were using it for. Okay? I don't know. I, inflating something, obviously. Um, but uh, we got this cardboard tube all, all, all mocked up, you know, with a pair of, of underwear, and uh, so it, it didn't work too well because, of course, you, you, air compressor takes a while to charge up, and it needs a power source and everything like that. But anyway, it worked okay, you know, sort of for the first summer and any uh, so i went away uh and i wanted to come back the following year and i thought well i can't rely on uh, you know finding a camp with an air compressor and uh yeah chris woof uh uh said the shirt cocking that's that's the phrase you know? <laughs> <clears throat> thanks chris um so anyway i decided that i should uh, that i should make i should i should build a man portable version of the uh, of the Pantsuka that didn't rely on electricity or compressed air or anything like that. So I went to the hardware store and I got these segments of ABS pipe and a big honk and spring from a machinist shop and, uh, you know, some other pits of, bits and pieces of metal and, and stuff like this. And I invented, and so I got this sort of spring loaded spring action one. So it works on the same principle as a British Piat you know, the projector infantry anti-tank, yeah. you know, like everybody remembers that scene in Bridge Too Far, 
remember everybody's seen a bridge too far and there's there's uh, the british paras are dug in in arnhem and the tank is approaching and the major major frost i think it says says bring up the pit you know so they bring up this weird looking piece of plumbing uh you know that's got a giant spring in it and they use it and then goes sprung you know and fires this bomb you know at the tank so anyway with this one, this was a man portable one. So you just have a, like a, like you sling it over your shoulder and kind of hold it. You hold it like a Panzerfaust. Um, and then you got another guy who reefs back on this handle and lets it go, compresses the spring, spring goes forward and goes crash. And this cardboard tube with a very tightly paired, uh, rolled pair of, of underwear shoots out the end. And we get a pretty good range on the thing, good 20, 20, 20 or 30 yards. And you can kind of, you know, like get a little bit of angle on it, kind of loft it, you know. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we used it a few times. But anyway, that's the history of the Pantsuka. Now, was, 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 uh, was your aim ever dangerous? Oh no, we never actually hit anybody. Ah, you know? And it's just yeah, it's yeah. just a, it's just a joke. You know, the whole place is like practical jokes. So nobody ever took it amiss or anything like that. You know, people are you know, people enjoy some people enjoy their nudity, uh, and but they're generally not too protective of it. You know, they're not too belligerent, put it that way, about their nudity. Uh, but you know, it's all a joke, it's all in fun, you know. I hadn't really planned on putting the term belligerent nudist in my head together tonight. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Oh, well, this, man. This, this is why people tune in. That's yeah. true. That's true. Viewership. Yeah. That's so anyway, yes, that's the story with Harold Buchanan and the Pansuka. And I mean, are you planning to go back to Burning Man? No. Is it? No, I'm I'm too old. Uh, it's too big. Uh, there's too much money there now. It's huge. And it's just kind of grown beyond anything that I ever found interesting in it. Uh, I made, you know, but I went for, for five years in a row and uh, made some good friends. Uh, besides the Pansuka, uh, I worked on the staff of a newspaper, uh, a daily newspaper that we produced uh, at Burning Man. And we would get together and we'd, you know, we'd write stories and then we'd uh, print the thing uh, on a, a risograph, which is a kind of uh, printing machine. It's a, like a cross between a photocopier and a mimeograph machine. And we had it loaded up in the back of this big cargo van. So I would write a few stories. Um, but well, yeah, it was actually it was electrically powered, not, not okay, hand cranked. Okay. Uh, but there are models that are hand cranked. And anyway, so I would write some of the stories, but I also like to print the thing. So th this is me, you know, like like we we travel like 900 miles from home to so that I could stand, you know, crouched over in the back of a of a, a cargo van, and it's 110 degrees inside. Yeah, man, I I, and I'm yeah. inches away from this big piece of machinery that's going ka chunk ka chunk ka chunk, you know, waiting to to grab bits of my anatomy and feed it in, <laughs> um, printing this newspaper. Oh, and clothing uh, optional. Yeah, that, well, yeah, I always wore a kilt. Uh, my, uh, okay, my, oh, actually, uh, on Board Game Geek, uh, I'm uh, LT Murnau on, on Board Game Geek, uh, and my avatar there is a, a, a photo of me taken at Burning Man uh, with the, uh, with the um, uh, pants, uh, sling arms. So, you know, look me up, look me up on Board Game Geek, and then you can see a picture of what the Pansuka looked like. But, but yeah, I, I always wore a kilt, at least. So, anyway. And I, hear, I hear it really is really hot, like disgusting hot. Well, it's like they tell you, it'll be a dry heat. Uh, and it, the, the thing is, is that it's very, very dry there. It's the bottom of a lake bed, uh, and it's very windy. Uh, but the wind is very dry. Uh, the air is very dry. The wind is always blowing, uh, and you're actually at a fairly high altitude. Uh, so it does get really cold at night. Um, it can get hot in the daytime, but it gets really cold at night too because there's so little moisture around. I think the nearest standing body of water is like, I don't know, 20 miles away or something like that. Um, so it can get really cold. And because you're in a very high altitude, you're, you're kind of wicking water away. You have to be really careful to stay hydrated out there. Because uh, I had seen people who were not taking care of themselves uh, and weren't drinking lots of water. They'd be walking along and just clunk. They just... <laughs> No, they just passed out, you know. I'm sorry, I'm laughing. But anyway, yeah. Um, and, and Brian, uh, did you, other than you and, and, and Joe Miranda, mm. did you guys meet other war gamers? Did you have a game happening? No, 
No, we didn't find anybody out there uh, who was into. There were probably people who were into board games and stuff like that, uh, but no, we didn't run into anybody like that. Um, and uh, Joe and I didn't have time to do any war gaming, although I did teach him uh, some of the rudiments of of Go because I brought this magnetized uh, go set with me uh, because the wind, as I said, the wind is always right. blowing. So there's no way you could keep a paper game, you know, moored. Uh, but I had a magnet, uh, like a magnetic go set. And I taught him, you know, some of how to play go out there. But I mostly, the dust is a significant just, issue. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it's a special kind of dust. It's very alkaline. It gets into everything and it's very alkaline and it eats metal. Uh, so you have to be very careful about how you, uh, like when you get home, you have to clean everything and you have to clean it with, uh, like a, like an acid solution, like a really? uh, diluted vinegar and that kind of thing to get the dust off it. Cause it's very clingy and very alkaline. Wow. Sounds like a grand old time. Well, it was a great time. And, you know, as I said, I went five years running, uh, but when I was done, I was done and I'm not going back. But it was a good time. And, you know, I made some friends that I still have. And it was a great experience. And I invented a new weapon system. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you still have the Panzuka? It's in pieces in my basement somewhere. I'm probably going to have to take it apart and decommission and get rid of it. You know? Well, I mean, uh, at the next con, you have to bring it over and, and film a, a demonstration. Oh, actually, uh, there since... is no way I'm getting that through an airport terminal. Mm. <laughs> However, I'm just thinking uh, the deodorant Zuka might be a welcome addition to many, many gaming events. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's a good thought, actually. Yeah. 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 And you just think, well, they don't make too many um, kinds that are round. And you know what I'm thinking about, the old ban? There's, yeah. Yeah. So you could make like a subcaliber you know, <laughs> chamber for the Pantsuka that would fire a smaller, you know, a smaller caliber, you know, like a, so, a, a band or something. Smaller caliber deodorant round. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> well, we've gotten off track. Yes, Are we you off track. The question? Um, I, I asked my uh, big question already, so I'm not prepared with a second one. Well, um, okay. I will mention though that, uh, that, uh, Brian, your game, A Distant Plane, is responsible for one of the top viewed videos on my channel. So it, it is right. actually kind of the, the video that got me doing this as a content creator in the first place. Um, I guess one thing that I have uh, been thinking about a lot lately, and, and your post on Minuteman, which I had seen a couple days ago, um, prior to this, it got me thinking about this again about just just how innovative a designer uh, Jim Dunnigan was. Uh, there, there's a lot of those games, and you know maybe not all of them quite work in, at the end of the day. But there's a lot of those games where he was really stretching the bounds of. I have no idea what that's all about. The bounds of what was considered inside the war game design space at the time, really with, with stuff like plot to assassinate Hitler and uh, even origins of world war two, right. Yeah. From which I think was only published by Avalon Hill, I think. Uh, but that's another one of his, um, the, the Russian civil war game. That's a cr crazy out of left field ideas yeah. uh, inside that game, which I just picked that up in the last few months, actually. Yeah. Well, this Artie, this is a Jim Dunnigan game. It's an SPI like one of those little games mm -hmm. that I paid 75 bucks for. <laughs> I, think I, paid, I think I paid six for mine. Oh, yeah. Well, that was long in, ago. In 1980. For God. Yeah. Anyways, at least the counters aren't punched. So uh, I thought that was uh, just kind of like uh, you're, you're a time traveling soldier and you get dropped into various eras and then you fight a little war game in each era. Yeah. So exactly. basically that's exactly what I thought. But when I read like the intro, so it, it's very nice that they had like an intro, a narrative to explain before the game. And the reason why it's called Time Tripper is because we're in Vietnam, according to the game, and the guy's a big stoner. So he does a lot of chemicals. So it, I'm telling you, it, I don't know if he's tripping or tripping. Mm -hmm. Well, it's both, I guess. I guess. I mean, and, and that <laughs> Jim Dunnigan did some weird off-the-cuff stuff. Oh, I don't think so. I, I, you know, 
Jim Dunnigan is he's he's my my hero of design. That guy is so relentlessly experimental and creative in the 70s and 80s. Um, and you know, I just I have so much respect for some of his experiments. And you're right, not all of them worked. Uh, and even when they didn't work, they were still interesting. I mentioned uh, the Power Politics series a while ago. Um, so Minuteman, of course, nobody else had taken really quite the same approach that he had to that kind of, well, because there were powerful few games about insurgency, you know, from that time period. Um, uh, Plot to Assassinate Hitler has that whole idea of loyalty chits. Uh, so the idea of having somebody secret or obvious loyalty to yourself. And this is a really interesting idea that I haven't seen picked up in I, no other examples really spring to mind. Um, but I, I think that was a, a really interesting idea. And of course, Russian Civil War you know, is the best known of all of these uh, and probably the most successful of, of those power politics series games. And everybody knows it is the game where you can win by attacking your own forces. Because everybody uh, who plays in the game ha uh, commands uh, an assortment of red, white, and green and blue forces. And depending on which side wins the game, red or white, you know, you need to be on the winning side and to be on the winning side you got to attack yourself so that was a, an idea that you know nobody had had uh, had sprung up at the time i think the i think the high point of my wargaming design career was reached in uh at one of the connections conferences at national defense university uh because uh jim dunnigan was there as one of the keynote speakers and i was there to speak on a panel on design of games on irregular warfare and so uh you know the panel's ready to go brent was uh chairing uh he was chairing the, the um the, the panel and so we're sitting there we're ready to go and you know, Jim Dunnigan had given the keynote speech earlier in the morning and Jim Dunnigan wanders in through the room and he sits down next to me because it's Jim freaking Dunnigan. And he sits down next to me uh, because there's it's like the last empty chair in the room because it was like standing room only in the room. And he muttered to me about, oh, it's standing room only back there. And I said, well, I figure you can sit wherever you want. Um, and then I went up and I made my presentation. It was about uh, Tupamaro, uh, a war game I had done on uh, the Tupamaro urban guerrillas in Uruguay. And I went back and I sat down and uh, J Jim Dunnigan, Jim freaking Dunnigan said, I like what you're doing. And I said, thanks. And I got to meet the guy and he liked what I was doing. And I'm just such a fanboy. Sorry. Yeah. I get sympathize anyway, with that. Yeah. No, it's just uh, I have a lot of time for him uh, for it, it, just about anything and everything that he did. Uh, and I really loved his own uh, willingness to experiment with ideas, to, to show models and build models in, in, in really unusual ways. And that was a spirit that he imbued uh, in almost everybody who worked at SPI. And SPI was always a really, really experimental, you know, again, not everything worked and everything was done in a big honk and hurry, uh, but they they went places nobody had gone before and still haven't gone very much. No, it's, so it's, it's an fantastic. inspiration. It's fantastic when one of your peers acknowledges you and, 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 and they know all about what you're doing, you know? Um, I, I have a short story. Uh, one of my friends is uh, Céline Zion's keyboard player. And uh, he was, he had, he had a band called Uzeb. And uh, they were in France. And uh, this guy's name is Jean Saint-Jacques. I'm sorry? Uzeb Eb. Uzeb Eb. I, yeah, I've heard of them. Anyway, please go on. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they were the best selling, uh, the best selling fusion jazz band in the world more so than weather report but anyways um so he's playing on stage whatever that's over at l'olympia in paris and uh john mclaughlin comes up to uh jean jean's the keyboard player and he specifically like called him out and said i really enjoyed your lines your your um improvisation lines he said that was the best compliment <laughs> that he's ever had in his life having a guy like John McLaughlin, same thing like James Dunnigan. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 
Well, I think that's something that's really important in the field of war game design. Uh, like Dunnigan wrote uh, the Complete War Games Handbook. Yeah. And in yeah. it, he has two fantastic resource, by the way. Fantastic resource available free online. Uh, and he has two very simple rules of, of uh, design for game designers. One, keep it simple. And two, plagiarize. Because well, I, sometimes he would say use available techniques. But anyway. Yeah, that's what artists do, man. Yeah, and so even when an artist is being innovative and creative, they still owe something. I like to say we 100%. crouch. On the, I like to say that we crouch on the shoulders of giants. So in such a small yet relentlessly creative hobby as as war game design, uh, people need to people need to name check. They they need to acknowledge their intellectual debts. And yeah. I'm always you know I, I like to think I'm always careful about that. No, and, that's good. That's good, man. Yeah. And look. Um, Wrapping this up, I wanted to ask you, uh, unless, Artie, do you have any other questions? You don't? Uh, not any other questions that will fit in the remaining time. Okay. Oh, are we done almost? Oh, oh. Well, I think we've got to keep it to an hour, so it's interesting. So if anything, we could come back and we do this again, uh, just like having a, a, a tavern beer or something, whatever. But my question was, um, what the hell was my question? Oh, I see there's a question here I can deal with quickly. Go Jeffrey ahead. Beeler, Jeffrey Beeler, hello, Jeff, uh, is answering a question. What are some of my naval game design elements? None. <laughs> I have never done a naval game. I will never do a naval game. I will never do an air game. I am an army guy. Sorry, you, but anyway, short answer, no. Do you have any events planned for ACDC? No, sorry, I don't. I'm kind of busy this weekend. Yeah, and I am. I and I. I have recently discovered Discord, but I am still really struggling with the elements of tabletop simulator, Ooh. Vassal, and Discord for playing games online. I am. I'm afraid. I, I'm really kind of stuck in in uh, cardboard and and physical physical presence. Uh, I know that I should learn how to make a vassal module because it would make playtesting so much easier. And I struggled over the holidays. I struggled with learning enough of Tabletop Simulator to make a, like, I, I'm going to upload a copy of uh, a Tabletop Simulator version of Gorilla Checkers pretty soon. Okay. Simplest game I've ever done. Very proud of it. Uh, but, you know, it was harder than it needed to be. <laughs> so I know there's all these newfangled things that I need to learn, but uh, I just I'm not at the point where I could host or play in a game in a convention. So sorry about that. But I'm very happy to talk to you guys today. This has been great. Thank very you. Uh, uh, Brian, you're a nice guy. Uh, Harold Harold is wrong, calling you a real bad 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 person. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I wanted to I, I wanted to swear a little bit. But Harold was just sore about the game the other day. No, yeah. don't, don't hold it against him. Artie, thanks thanks for doing this. I know I took up a lot of uh, blab. No, blab. this is everybody had a good time, and that's the important thing. And so, uh, Artie, do you have anything happening at uh, uh, ACDC? Yes, indeed, I am running the. OCS, Operational Combat Series Boot Camp, that is at 8 p.m. this evening. Oh. Um, I anticipate that uh, there'll be four players that I actually are pushing pieces around using Vassal, but it will also be streamed live on the channel and available for viewing whenever YouTube figures out <laughs> that the, the, the live stream has ended. Uh, it'll be available for viewing after the fact as well for people who want to learn OCS. I, I mean, I would have popped by, but I have an 8 o'clock interview with... Um, Devin Heinel, the OG. Mm, the OG. And uh, Keith Tracht, and the man is not the man you think he is. He's a man. <laughs> so, and then tomorrow, uh, Brant and I will be doing the rap uh, convention rap happy hour at, I think it's at 5 p.m. Eastern, I, I want to say. Okay, that's tomorrow, eh? So, yeah, and that'll be live on, uh, it'll be in the Discord for the uh, convention, and then it'll be live on my channel as well. So, um, I mean, depending on the time, both of you guys, um, what's the first con you're going to go to? Like, So, actually, there's news. Uh, Origins has announced their intention to run a convention in October, again, of 2021. Um, I don't have any inside information. I'm just telling you what my hunch is, is that every event that is in the first six or six to eight months of the year will end up not happening. 
Oh, yeah. And then after that, so 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 like end of year events. So this like rescheduled fall origins in the fall thing that might happen. Compass Expo in November might happen. Um, I'm definitely hoping both events occur because I have. I mean, I'm I, I last year was I think that I, I've been to like 25 origins, something like that. And last year I, I couldn't go because it got canceled. So um, I'm I'll you know whatever happens I'll I'll. I'll be at Origins. I'll be at Buckeye Game Fest if that happens. That's typically in September, so that's kind of, you know, I, I don't trust any event to actually occur at this. I point. know, I know. I, 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 uh, Brian, are you a WBC guy? No, there are only two Wargame cons that I go to regularly uh, each year. One is uh, Consum World Expo in Tempe, and I believe John is going to John Krantz is going to try and reschedule that to the end of August. Uh, actually, the week leading up to Labor Day. So that will kind of neatly fill the hole in my social schedule now that I'm not going to Burning Man anymore. Uh, and uh, But I don't think I'm going to be able to make it to that. I just don't see the, the cross-border situation or international travel or the disease sorting it out in time. The other con I go to is in November over uh, Remembrance. It's the uh, the weekend before Remembrance Day. And uh, that's called Bottos Con. And it's in Vancouver, uh, put together by my friend Rob Bottos. Uh, just a small weekend con in a hotel, like, uh, you know, maybe 100 people at most. Uh, but it's small. And, you know, I just uh, get to see people from, you know, Washington and Idaho, as well as British Columbia. And it's always a fun little weekend, very compressed. But I love going to Consum World Expo, too, because it's like all week long. And I just get to sit and talk design with so many people and it's so much fun and that's the thing with con i want to go to constant press because you go uh, Artie goes stuka joe goes no i've never been you've never been no i've been to yeah. i've been to oh, week-long gaming events though i'm thinking that's, about the, that's the yeah so that's the other thing is there's yeah. only as far as i'm aware there's four events that are basically week-long wargaming events there's constant world expo which i think the dallas one's not all week there's WBC, which I've never been to, it was supposed to go a couple of years ago. Last year, it went in the toilet. Um, there's Winterfest in Sandusky, Ohio, which I keep reporting on every year. And there's Buckeye Game Fest, which is a little bit less time. It's a Monday through Sunday war room. And there's a lot of other board gaming happening there, but we don't care. We got we got a war room. Is there a reason why you haven't gone to WBC? Uh, well, the year that I was supposed to go, yeah, there was a reason. I my car broke. So uh, there was a the car's air conditioner doesn't work yeah. and the windows stopped rolling down. So I wasn't going and it's in July. So I wasn't going to drive four hours to central, you know, eastern, western Pennsylvania yeah. in July with a car yeah. that, where the windows don't roll down. The air conditioner doesn't work. So I had to stay home and fix the car. Well, I mean, Otherwise, I it's it's also a, a tournament driven event. Yes. And I'm not really a tournament competitive wargamer type person some people are and that's fine i'm not particularly no. there's, there's plenty of other stuff happening there too right. so i want to go yeah that's another reason why i don't go to many cons is because of what you said being tournament driven or people pre-arranging these games mm -hmm. and constant world expo the big draw there is the monster games and yeah. i i don't do that so what i do is i come down to, to uh constant world or i go to bottos con with a big bag of stuff that i've been working on and i want to show to people you know maybe i can snag somebody into a play test but i'm more interested in showing things to people and you know say, what what do you think and just hashing out design with people uh that's the real draw for me is just meeting people and talking about their designs and you know what the kind of games they're into that kind of thing but organized play no not not my uh, and how are the constant world grounds are they are they um is there food around to get is it easy to get stuff uh in that area at, at in at Consum World in Tampa, yeah, yeah, like beverages yeah. to get food. Uh... Yeah, it's in the middle. It's in uh, what they call the Mill District or Mill Avenue, uh, which is kind of the playground for the uh, frat boys and girls uh, right. who go to Arizona State University, which is down the road. You can basically get anything there. <laughs> lots of, well, lots of good student food, uh, lots of bars and things like that. Uh, and, of course, the con is held in a hotel, which is very nice, has its own, uh, at, you know, um, uh, restaurant and stuff. Oh, like that. Okay, cool, cool. Yep, good food. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of going down. Though, like I said, man, I'm not a heavy war gamer, and there, the access is on monster games. Like, what the hell am I going to do? 
Well, you know what usually happens, though, is because it's a week long thing. Not everybody goes for all week, but the people who go for all week to play one of those things, I see them, they come in and then they spend about a day and a half setting up the monster game and then they'll play it spend another day and a half playing two or three turns and then they'll just kind of shake on it and say okay i figure you probably would have got it that, and then, that's totally that's totally and then, it. They, and then they leave it set up for the rest of the week <laughs> you know occupying a table they might get to so a couple more it. turns okay yeah, might, I don't feel so bad that's, been known, that's been known to happen i mean i i've i've had having done the the monster game events um, it's a unique experience, right? You don't, it, it's, it's an experience. I would encourage everybody that can experience it to try it, if, see if they like it, to be able to be focused on one thing for like multiple days at a time. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, a, a lot of times you're not, you're playing something like Atlantic wall or a big OCS game or something like that. You're not playing it to the end, right? The last turn. Okay. You're, you're, you're playing it to the point at which everybody pretty much agrees one side has won. Okay. Okay. Whatever that is, if that happens on Wednesday, it happens on Wednesday. Then you go do other stuff. It's all good. Yeah. And there's lots of other events going on at Concert World Expo, too. There's publishing companies come. So, like, Gene Billingsley comes and he gives the State of the Union for GMT and what they'll be producing over the next year, or what their stuff they're working on. There's seminars on design. Uh, you know, there's lots of uh, people speaking about things. And again, there's lo loads and loads of demos and play tests and stuff like that going on. But just milling around, you know, meeting people and getting to know people is, is great. All right, guys, thank you very much. Brian, thanks a lot, man, for doing this. I, uh, I also would like to thank Brant. Uh, would you say he's one of the core organizers of the, of the ACDC? I believe he's the grand poobah of this grand. entire affair. So thank you, Brant. Thanks, Artie, for doing this, man. I really Happy appreciate it. Brian, we're going to see each other one day. Yes. Do you drink scotch? Sometimes, yep. There you go. That's enough. Um, <laughs> That's enough. So, thank, Brian, thanks a lot, and uh, enjoy your Vancouver weather. Uh, Artie, enjoy your cosmopolitan... Whatever. Whatever this is. You know, and uh, thank you very much, guys. Thank you thanks very much, lot. people. Who, you know, we had a good turnout, man. We had like 35 people at one point, which is something incredible for me. But anyways, okay, have a good day, guys. All right, thank all right. everyone, have a good one. Saludo. Bye-bye. We done? I think so. Dan bailed. Okay. But All he right. has not ended the live stream yet. Okay. <laughs> well, let's just Dan, keep going. Dan, 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 Dan. We could. I, yeah. uh, I know. Nice to meet you. There he is. I'm there, yeah, right yeah, now. Nice to meet you. Actually, I, 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 I was so excited that when Dan asked me to do that, so... Well, I mean, I wanted someone intelligent to ask questions, but I forgot that I got a big mouth and I keep <laughs> rambling on and I change subject every, like half sentence, half a sentence, I will change subject. Mark that. <laughs> so we're, Dan, we're content creators. We're going to, we're going to have a big mouth. That's going to happen. Yeah, I know. But did you see my girlfriend came in, told me to shut up before? No. Oh, no. Yeah, no, that was, I had, I had a stream before um, coming on this one. And uh, she comes in and she tells me to shut up. I'm too loud. <laughs> That's unfortunate. And she's not even Italian. Thank oh. God. <laughs> she, she'd have you'd been dead if she'd have been Oh, Italian. my God. I would have got something in the head, man. <laughs> anyway. see, see from off camera this huge pasta pot come flying. And you know something? Man, <laughs> Brian, what nationality are you? Train sounds very... Uh, well, my family, my, my father's family is Scottish. Uh, and the name Train is a sept of the McDonald clan. Uh, and my mother's family is sort of Austrian German. So kind of in there. Oh, so we, we were friends once. I sure. Yeah, I'm friends with everybody. No, I'm, I'm talking about I'm talking about, uh, you know, being allied to you in World War Two. But anyways, I digress. Well, hey, the Italians were everybody's friends in World War One. You see? You they see both sides. You know, it, 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 something was wrong there. It, it was obviously it's the government. It's always the government. <laughs> but let's not talk about government, eh, USA? Ooh, what did I just say? <laughs> we're not. Let's not talk politics, Brian. We're different. We're yeah. sorry. We're nice. Uh, we can take the cold. 
Um, we know what happens when when we go on a road and there's a lot of trees. We slow down because, you know, the moose might pop out. If you hit a bloody moose, the chances of you surviving, I would say, are probably 1%. Yeah, the car bends around the moose. Oh my God! Even my, one of my friends is a—it's funny. The, the stream is still live, but it's over. Anyways, yeah. one of my friends is a truck driver, and I said, "Thank God you're a truck driver because when the moose pop out, he goes, are you crazy? It's like we hit the moose and it comes right into the cab.' Yeah. I will, <laughs> Jesus! I will, never, I will never forget the first time I saw a live moose. Uh, this was—I was at the infantry school in New Brunswick. Uh, uh, and we were out running around, you know, running in the morning. But that and, was that was in Oromocto? Yep. Yep. <laughs> Everybody's passed through the infantry school at some time. You know, if you're in the combat arms in the Canadian forces, you've been Oromocto. through you've been to Oromocto. So anyway, uh, we're out running down a road, you know, in the morning, and uh, you know, there's a moose having breakfast in a in a big pond next to the road, and he and he he just whips his head up, you know, and it's like, and I'd never seen anything so big. Oh my They're god! Huge. Yeah. Jesus. I mean, I mean, certain parts of Africa have their elephants. We got our moose, man. Yeah. Bloody hell! No, they're gigantic. You know, I mean. <clears throat> My ex mother in law was a moose. You should have seen her, man. <laughs> it's yeah. okay. She's but anyway, dead now. So I, I don't think Constant World Expo is going to be available to me in time, but BotosCon, I might get down there to Vancouver because November, Vancouver, we might have the vaccination situation sorted by then. Jeez, it's November, man. Yep. So what about that uh, convention that's in Quebec? Stack, is it Stack Academy? Oh, yeah. Stack Academy. That's in Montreal? Yeah, yeah I, don't know what, where, I don't know what time of year that, that is, though. It, 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 well, I mean, he, it, it, uh, the, it's Marc Guinette who runs yeah. it. Super nice guy. And um, they actually, it's such a small, a small uh, thing. Yeah, I know the stream is still running. I forgot to punch it out, but I figured, what the hell, people might like to hear uh, rambling on. Um yeah. And um, they had John Butterfield there. Uh, Brian, were you invited? Uh, Mark uh, invited me to one, and he even put me up. So I've been to a couple of stacks, uh, and usually it's in the springtime. Yeah, and it's very it's it's in a hotel usually, and it's it's very quiet. There's what about fifty to a hundred people maybe at the most. Yes, yeah, about that. But you're right. You're at your downtown Montreal, and if. That excites anybody. It doesn't excite me anymore. Trust me. I used to work downtown for like 12 years. I don't care about downtown. I want to see cows. And I'm not talking about my ex-mother-in-law. But anyways, uh, you're downtown. You're right in the heart of food, bars. I mean, uh, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't frequent strip joints, but I mean, we seem to have the best strip joints around. Definitely Montreal. the friendliest. Yeah. No, Montreal is good for those kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and so you had a fun in Ottawa, I tell you. By Ottawa, for God's sakes, Brian! Seriously, I used to work there. I had a staff in job Ottawa. In, it, I had a staff job in the army in Ottawa a couple of years. Oh my God, how boring can you get? Well, if anybody wanted to have fun, they needed to walk across the bridge to Hull. Yeah, because, <laughs> like, I I don't know if you know, Artie, but uh, Ottawa is in Ontario. And it's next to the Ottawa River, and you cross over the Ottawa River, and you're in Quebec, where they have a lot of different provincial laws. Like, mm. for example, Ontario has a lot of sort of blue laws or conservative laws, but in Quebec, you can buy beer and wine in grocery stores, which you normally can't do in Canada. And yeah. you know, the strip clubs are supposed to be better, and all this kind of stuff. But you know, it's yeah, just I'm, and I'm the just saying, better. Yeah, I'm just saying, you know, because th there's a lot of young people or whatever. Not like old people don't like strip joints, but whatever. I'm sure there's a large, young, and impressionable audience watching this stream right now. You think so? They're going to get the wrong idea, and they're all going to go to Quebec. No. I don't know, Artie. This is a war gaming stream. I think there's a lot of grognards, you know, yeah. where things hang a little bit too low. Yeah. I'm <laughs> I'm almost always the youngest person in the, in the war gaming world. Yeah. Not always, yeah. but, uh, but a lot of the time. Yeah. yeah well, I, as soon as Stack Academy happens again, I'm going to run to it because – um, it, it's funny, eh? Yeah. Um, I, I enjoy I enjoy people at my time when I want to enjoy people. When I don't want to enjoy people, just like anybody else, it's get the f away from me. I want to go home. This and that. But I have missed 
the social contact with people. I can't go to my, re I can't go, I can't wait to go to my first restaurant, believe it or not. And I can't wait to go to my con. And I don't care if they smell like B.O. It's welcome. You should consider Origins, actually. It is. Uh, Are you kidding? There's like 100,000 people. Oh, it's only about 40 or 50, actually. Nah, nah, forget it. My, my yeah. town, there's 300 people in my town. Yeah. Come on. You know, it, it, there's a wonderful shopping available, for example. And I have it, no money. There, well. <laughs> well, another another reason why I go to Consum World is because it's in Arizona. And I can get my wife to go with me because she loves the desert and she loves the heat. Uh, and I like it, too. So, I, but I'm afraid that uh, Origins or WBC doesn't offer that well, oh, no, 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 no. It's funny that you say that since since we're live, but we're not officially live. Uh, Brian, you seem to me like an experimenting type of guy, like, you know, going to Mexico in those huts, doing doing some aloe vera, for lack of a better word. <laughs> Never touch the stuff. The aloe vera? No, you're not supposed to eat it, but peyote you could. No, I never touch that stuff Terrible. either. I'm, 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 I'm a lightweight with lots of things. So, <laughs> And you yeah. see, Brian, you see, with, with, with your – you're a cut above intelligence type thing. You know what I mean? Because you, you speak well, you use words, you read books. I don't do that stuff. But anyways – uh, well, you're trying, to, you're trying, to, you're trying kind of to get something out of me now. And, and, and yeah, yeah, and um, you being an intellect, and you know, like you can go into different levels without LSD. Imagine if you did LSD. Uh, no, I. It's sometimes when minds get opened, they fall apart. I see. You're so you're susceptible. You're susceptible to certain. Yeah. Yeah, you're like me. Yeah, it's uh, it's certainly not for everybody. And yeah, you know, no, when I when I used I, to do acid, well, my my short take on a lot of that about you know drugs helping people's creativity is, you know, the I think one of the greatest enjoyments of art is the act of creating it. Of course, and probably the act of creating it while you're on drugs is probably even more interesting, but the end product is not that inspiring. Hey. So I don't know. That's just I my beg opinion. to differ there, uh, sir. Please differ. Please differ. I, sir. I differ a lot with Mozart because mm -hmm. Mozart's thing was snuff boxes. And what do you think he had there? Sage? You know <laughs> what I'm saying? That not tobacco? I don't know. Well, supposedly it was tobacco. But uh, well, I mean, I, did they have the way? I don't know. I've never researched this. Did they have the wacky tobacco back then in Austria? The wacky tobacco? I mean, I'm talking about cocaine. Well, I, I, don't I, I, I don't know. I don't think they had it back then. They had cocaine back then. Uh, they well, had not, cocaine, no, like morphine not, and stuff. Not in Europe. I don't think they had it in Europe. The snorting kind. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I've never. I, I, I have no man. I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's keep it clean, eh, uh, Mister? I have no idea. Forty years old. He's got no idea. <laughs> How did we get on this? The topic of you cocaine know, and something. And some, some, started it. Something else is weird, Brian. That you live in BC. Understand, you live in BC. You're my age. You're a child of the 60s, same as me. And you're telling me that you living in BC has no bearing on your mind. Uh, well, okay. I think I see what I, I, I think I hear what you're getting at. But no, yes, I, sir. Never, I never touched that either. And well, of course, my dad was a Mountie. So, you know. Well, he got uh, the best stuff, man. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, was, I digress. I'm he joking. He wasn't into that end of policing, but no. uh, it's, it's an interesting <laughs> no. It's an interesting notion, though. You know, because I, I, I was uh, already. I was talking to Dan uh, a few days ago. Uh, we were just chatting to kind of test uh, the stream yard and see if the connection worked. And we were talking about the weather out here. And I, I'm not sure where you are. Where are you? I'm in Central Ohio. Okay, so it's probably pretty snowy where you are. It doesn't snow out here. It might snow once or twice. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a, a damp, rather English climate. It's like, I don't know, Manchester. You know, yeah, in, that, in, in like uh, a maritime something, something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like that. So this is the most temperate climate in Canada because it snows maybe once or twice in the winter and doesn't stay for long. But it's a damp cold that never really goes away. And the sun, you don't see very much of the sun for about five months. And that is something that 
uh, when I moved out here, uh, it took a little bit of getting used to because I used to live in Ottawa and in Ottawa, it's freaking cold. It's like minus 20, you know, not on, not uncommon, uh, no. but it's sunny and the sun helps keep your morale up. And I've, I've always found that warm. to actually be the case. But out here, there's just not enough sun. And he, it, it kind of weird. Like this time of year, January and February, after the holidays, before springtime, it really kind of wears on me uh, because it's cold and it's damp. And, you know, it's a, uh, yeah, but it's it's my least favorite time of year. Well, I mean, and, and I keep harping on this and I'm, I'm, I'm being facetious. Um, no, but best- climate, climate affects your mental state and your mental well, yeah. state is your creative yeah. state. Absolutely. I, and, I've always felt that I'm in a better mood when it's sunny. And yeah. the thing is, is that if you're in BC with that tempered climate, that's a little bit gloomy and humid. Mushrooms go the best, the <laughs> best in that weather. The best. It's like I'm not, I'm not, even, I'm not even talking psychedelics. Yeah, you know, I'm just saying yeah. mushrooms all over. But psychedelics, holy cow! I mean, yeah. in BC. Um, and the thing is. Is that we're? I I I, I used to work in, in psychiatry, Brian, till yes. I got fired. Yeah. Who would fire me? Come on. But anyways, uh, twenty years. Okay. So a lot of these people, a lot of the social workers, a lot of the psychiatrists, are microdosing mushrooms. Yeah, I've, I've and it read, helps to watch their day to day happiness. Yes. So you know what? Screw the microdosing, just do the whole goddamn thing. <laughs> well, I, 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 I don't know. It's, um, it's, it, I don't think it's for me, but I, I've read an awful lot about its use in, in therapy and to help people get their lives, you know, in their minds. I'm telling you, man. Out. I'm telling to make you. Them happier, more integrated people. Uh, because there's so many different ways that people can become disintegrated. And, of course. You know, anything that, any, any therapy that helps. Yeah, look, uh, I was going to say something which I totally forgot, for God's sake. Oh, yeah, living better through chemistry. <laughs> yeah. Je me champagne friton. This makes me want to drink more. <laughs> oh, did you ever have poutine? Me? No, I guess yeah. not. Brian? Uh, I've had it. No, I, I had genuine Montreal poutine. Like, we, you, There's places oh. you can get poutine out here in Victoria because Victoria is the headquarters of the Pacific Fleet. So we have a number of Franco sailors out here. So there's a little bit of an appetite out here for poutine. And it's, okay. it's, become, a favorite, it's become a favorite pub food out here too. But genuine Montreal uh, poutine, I've had that and it's good. It, I had, like, I, I mean, had with, uh, smoked meat, it was good. It's got trendy, it's, so it's a, uh, you can actually get poutine here in Ohio. No, you can't. Well, I, you know, I don't know about its authenticity, but you you can get something they call poutine, and it's French fries with cheese curds and gravy on it, and that's delicious. So we we've we well, I say we've. I, I'm I'm Italian Canadian, so we've Quebecer uh, <clears throat> have raised that to an art, the poutine. I if, think- if you- it's what? such an art, I can't even recognize it when you say it. You're My friend, fancy. if you guys come down, and I will pay. I have no money, but I will pay. Okay? I will take you to a place called Le Pied de Cochon, the, the pig's foot, where we'll just sit down, get out one bottle oh, of wine, yeah. which, which you guys are going to pay because I'm paying for the bill, and um, you're going to have poutine with foie gras. I had a great time at Les Pieds Cochons. Uh, it was a stack academy that Mark invented, invited us to, and Volko and Volko was there, and we all went, and it was a great time. So much meat on that menu. I had yeah. French onion soup, and there was like a pork chop in it. <laughs> but yeah, you know what I think the key to poutine is is the gravy. It's mm-hmm. a the proper gravy is like a chicken gravy that you've mm-hmm. cooked for like a week until it's like engine oil. Mm. Uh, and I think that the regular, you know, the sort of pseudo poutine that people get in restaurants here, it's just ordinary gravy. It's, it's like getting a Philly like cheesesteak in Montreal. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyways, okay, guys, I uh, I have to go this time. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. It this time. <laughs> and uh, Artie, thanks again, man. And yeah, uh, no Brian, Brian, you know what? I, I'm going to call on you again. We could do this just for laughs and giggles. Sure. We're only three time zones apart, so it's easy for me to do that on the weekend. Okay. 
Thank you. And I'm cutting it off this time. And I'm pressing the end broadcast. Okay. And